Matt, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Well, I actually just found out earlier today, Matt, that you actually subscribed, I think, to the strength running email list way back in like 2011. So this is like going full circle. Yeah, it really is. I have been uh, like a consumer of your media. I, I that sounded really weird. I've been following you and reading your stuff for over a decade. So it's really fun to be on here. And I'm very honored uh, to be able to have a conversation with you. It's really fun. This is really fun. I'm, look, I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, for sure. And, and for anybody actually just listening to the podcast right now, definitely go over to YouTube and check out the video because Matt has the best background, especially for this actual show. So Matt, you are on brand today. I love it. Thanks. And, yeah. uh, we're going to talk about running shoes today and, and how to choose like the right shoe for you. And, and more importantly, how to think about choosing the right shoe. Because I, I doubt anybody is going to come away from this call thinking to themselves, oh, now I know the actual make and model of shoe that I'm going to go buy. Uh, instead, I really want to talk about types of shoes and different features so that runners have a better framework for thinking about things. Um, and Matt, you created the Doctors of Running Instagram account that's all about shoes. So I'm really excited to chat with you about this. Um, I guess to start, would you say that you have a specific framework or methodology for thinking about running shoes or, or to ask in a different way, how do you even start to recommend shoes to a runner who might come to you for advice? That's a, that's a very good question. That's actually one of the things that we've been trying to answer, be it, you know, the Instagram, which all, all kudos goes to our, my team that we've got, a, I've got a really phenomenal group that we all work together to develop and share this stuff, right? So we've got Instagram, YouTube, all that kind of stuff, wherever you consume media. And the goal is to help people make better decisions about what they're putting on their feet, but also to figure out kind of what works best for you. And this was all started with the, like working in running stores and being very confused about like, well, I was told this, I was told that, oh, neutral and stability, that's the only way we categorize shoes and then racing. And then there's some variation between that. And I was, there, there's more to that. And that was before I was a, P, a physical therapist. And then obviously long before being a PhD candidate and all this crazy stuff that I'm doing right now. But I, what we have learned over the years, not just from clinical experience, but also from the literature out there, is one of the more important things out there is trying to figure out, A, what tool am I even looking for? What am I going to be doing? And then how does it feel? Which kind of sounds like a little like uh, people are like, oh, he's getting all touchy feel. No, it's actually we have very good evidence that how the shoe fits on your foot and feels underfoot is actually very related to how well you're going to do in that shoe. So if I was going to say there's some kind of framework, one of the things that we've tried to do is go, how can we help people figure out what is going to work for them as an individual? You mentioned earlier going, hey, you know, we kind of want to figure out like you know, the common thing is what's the best running shoe? And that doesn't exist because these are tools. You're going to have different tools for different people. And even within people, you're going to have different tools for different things that people want to do. So the framework is starting out with what do you want to do? right? Do you just want to go out? You just want to get used to running. You just want to get some miles in, get used to this new activity. Or do you want to start, you know, you've got some experience in it, but you want to start competing. You want to start running faster. You want to get on trail. You want to stay on road. You, these are all part of this kind of framework that's slowly been coming together. That, and our job isn't to necessarily gives people like, oh, you have to do the step-by-step -step process. It's how can we help you figure out what's going to work for you? So very like trying to develop an individualized approach, which obviously means there's a ton of variability. Yeah, but it reminds me very much about pacing because yeah. pacing is something where the feel of it is so important. And it's also a very difficult thing to teach or discuss because it's very subjective. Uh, it, you know, according to, you know, if you're looking at pace, it's very objective. But if you're looking at effort and how that feels and all the things that kind of go into that, it, it's a very similar topic um, because, if you're a new runner, that feeling is almost like a foreign language that you have to decipher and learn over time. And, and I would say it's very similar with shoes, right? Like you, you sort of have to try a lot of shoes to then understand what actually feels good on your foot when you're out there running. And there's so much variability to how it's going to feel that we haven't been in, begin to predict that. It's not like I'm trying to get out of going, here's the biomechanical data. It's because we, my, myself and then the, the people that have been doing this for years before me, all the researchers, 
we can't find a biomechanical correlation between something that's necessarily going to work for somebody and then actually keeps them healthy, happy, and running. That we can't find that. There's other factors. And the, the things that we found that really relate the most is, how does it feel on foot? Is it comfortable? Is it something you're want to you're gonna want to run in? And there's some really great stuff out there. I, I people will probably hear me hear me reference this all the time, but the Run Cat scale, which is actually a validated and reliable measure out of Australia, a couple awesome people like went through the insane process to validate this thing, which takes years. Actually, found that they like took all these variables and got it down to like five different things in terms of. How does the upper fit on your foot? How does the heel feel? How does the forefoot feel? What's the what's the flexibility? And then what is the like stability? And none of those are like oh super state like super stable is better or not stable is better. It's like where does it feel good for you? And obviously, if you hand that to a new runner, they're like I don't know what you're talking about. And it's something that people have to learn. On that same thing you mentioned talking about pace, we've actually found in the research, I'm a, so being a PhD, this is one of the things I have to look at is, I have to standardize what pace people are going at. And the problem is, if you say seven minute mile for one person, that's gonna be a totally different effort level for somebody else. So much of the research world is actually going, we're gonna base this based on somebody's effort. That's our new standard. And at, physiologically, that's actually where, like having people learn what that, that optimal pace is for them, that's actually where they tend to have the best physiological performance and the most consistent one, which is interesting. I think people need to give more credit to themselves and learn this stuff, which I know you talk about all the time, but it's, it can be challenging to get people to go, hold on, you got to figure this out. Yeah, I've long said that one of the best ways to choose a pair of running shoes is to actually go to store, try it on, and then hopefully they'll let you either run around the store, get on a treadmill, or even maybe even run around the block. And if it feels good when you're running, it's probably a good shoe for you. Um, so yeah, I guess we could just wrap up the podcast here, right? Yeah, that's it. That's basically <laughs> it. It's over. That's like 50, 60 years of footwear research, basically in a, in a nutshell. No, just kidding. I, I do <laughs> like how there is so much power in that simple question. Yeah. How does it feel on your foot? You know, because I was going to ask you all about, you know, how do you determine stability and stack height and arch support and heel toe drop and all these different aspects of running shoes? And it's almost like it, it sounds like you almost shouldn't get too far in the weeds with all these individual characteristics of shoes and instead just focus a little bit more holistically on the entire shoe. I would say initially, yes. Definitely initially going, hey, I'm just getting into this. But as you start to learn more about you, what you really like, that is when you can actually get into that stuff. If you're somebody and you can start looking at, hey, what, what areas have I maybe had problems before? This is where as a PT I come in going, well, you've had some history of this, this, and this. You might want to think about these components of the shoe because that might – you know, help facilitate your movement a bit a little bit better. It might make it more comfortable, but honestly, you I'm gonna give you the suggestion, but you need to go try this and see how it feels, right? So the like the most common thing people, you know, for those of us that have been in the running industry and worked in running stores and bought running shoes and anywhere the last 15 years, the old way was, as I mentioned, is you're either, a, you need a neutral shoe or a stability shoe. And that didn't work because we found that there are people that, that Again, this this term is not bad that pronate or supinate, they have some frontal plane motion, side to side motion. And just because you do that doesn't mean it's a problem. That's just describing emotion. Nobody's even standardized what over pronation means. That's not even standardized. People just throw the term out there. So we realized that, that just because based on somebody's static arch height or their movement didn't necessarily mean that you needed a stability shoe or a posted shoe. But then we did some additional research and found, hey, if you've had an injury that is related to the motion of pronation, like a posterior tibialis problem, maybe a little Achilles stuff, you might actually want to try this. It might help you. Like all evidence, we got to be a little careful with how we say that. But then you might, if you've had a problem, then we might, we might want to think about this. So the more experience you get, then you can be like, you know what? I've learned I kind of like a lower drop shoe or I like a higher drop shoe or I like an upper that fits wider or more snug. Those are great questions. You just have to ask yourself, when are they appropriate to be asking? Yeah, I've certainly learned for myself personally over the years, like what kind of shoe that I typically like and, and will thrive in. So now I can almost look at a pair of shoes and just immediately say, oh yeah, those are probably going to work for me or no, those are definitely not going to work for me. So, you know, if the heel toe drop is 12 millimeters or more, or if there's a flared heel, 
I know that those shoes are just going to feel just off, very uncomfortable. I don't like a really high stack height. And so I, I'm, I'm more in the, that sweet zone of four to eight millimeter heel toe drop, you know, mostly, mostly a neutral shoe. Although with my Achilles giving me some issues, maybe I should get a little bit more stability in my shoe. Who knows? You don't know if it's uh, if if it's just looking again. It's we had to figure out why is that? Is it a shoe related problem? Is it a training related problem? That's where the big question comes in to, to start thinking holistically. Going where and you as as someone who talks about strength and coaching and things like that, you got to go. The shoe is a is a tool. It's one piece of this equation. As much as we geek out on this, it is really important to not to try to solve everything with the shoe, right? If you're and I'm not I'm not saying you are, but if you're overtraining or you're missing strength in a certain area or something's going on, shoe's great, but you got to make sure you address all the things first and don't just try to cover it up with the shoe because shoes are great tools, but they are. Not that one of the, my greatest comments that I uh, when I had a, did a podcast with Simon Bartold, who's a hero of mine, is that shoes will not prevent will will not prevent injuries. Right, a choosing the wrong one might cause one, but they will not prevent them. It is up to you to learn to utilize them well and to decide with training, strength, whatever you need to do that will keep you healthy. Matt, I thought this was going to be an easy answer where I should just get some stability shoes and my Achilles problem would go away because no. I know it's a training problem. Right. I know I'm not doing what I 100% should be doing over here. So that's on me. Yeah. Um, I do want to talk about this idea of shoes as training tools because mm -hmm. I think this is a really important concept that, that will help runners choose an appropriate shoe based on what they're doing that day. Right. So, can you talk a little bit more about this idea and, and you know, what types of shoes might be better for certain types of runs? Yeah, that's a great question. Cause again, people don't really realize that shoes are tools. The, uh, if you talk enough to people in the running industry and we are very fortunate to get to talk to a ton of people, literally we're, we're, we're talking with the company for the podcast, uh, for Doc's running podcast last night. And they had, they, for people in the running industry love to use cars as analogies because the design and development of running shoes oftentimes will mimic some of the concepts behind cars, right? Let me give you a great analogy or example. If you are going to the grocery store, do you think it might be more appropriate to take a Lamborghini or a Honda Civic, right? I don't know how you roll, Matt, but I'm taking the Lambo. All right, great. If it's down the street, right? So, but then you got, which is fine. You might be able to do that. <laughs> That's fine. But if the, the challenge becomes, it is a wider car, it is super lightweight, but trying to navigate through a narrow parking lot where you're worried about hitting somebody else or going, I don't necessarily have the maneuverability I want for these smaller spaces. I might not have the space to take groceries, right? If I go to Costco or wherever, like, do I have the space in my trunk to take this? Maybe this wasn't the best call. You could do it, right? But is it really the best tool for a job versus a Honda Civic is going to have, yeah, it's not as flashy. It's not as necessarily a sexy car per se, but it's got trunk space. It's safe. It's usually very maneuverable. It's probably, it's more efficient for what you're planning to do. So that's where shoes as tools come in where, you know, you could take an alpha fly for your easy run. That's fine. You know what, if you can handle that and it, and you are actually able to keep that, that run easy. Great. You know, I, it's not something I would do, but I'm not going to judge you for it. That said, there's going to be better tools for that because the uh, that shoe was not designed to be running at easy paces. It doesn't mean that somebody running, you know, eight minute pace isn't going to have some benefit. That's just not how that's you're not getting the best benefit out of that shoe. Something like if you were staying with Nike, a Nike Pegasus or a Saucony Triumph or any of those shoes, those were designed for training, right? That's how they were tested. That's how they were developed. And if you start using a tool for what it's not intended for, whatever happens is on you, right? If you, you're, that Lamborghini is in your small space and you hit the, the, the throttle too hard, or the, the, the gas too hard, and you run into another car, it's like, oh, this might not have been the best option. Versus Honda Civic is gonna be a little slower to respond, but it's that's what it's supposed to do for that purpose versus this would switch if you're going to the racetrack or you're going to drive really fast right so if you're going to do a workout that's where all these super shoes these racing shoes are designed for they are designed and tested in the lab at these paces they're not designed and not tested to run easy so it's just being able to match so that's exactly you would want to take the lamborghini to race unless you've got some crazy souped up honda civic which 
that's another conversation is going the honda civics are definitely changing right traditional footwear training shoes are getting some of the super shoe stuff so things are starting to get a little muddled but it's because everything is designed for a certain purpose biomechanically in the lab physiologically a lot of the companies use metabolic carts they're designed for specific things if you're not using that tool for what it's intended for I don't, you know, you, you might be fine. You might not. That's going to be, that's, it's just trying to use something for how it's designed. Yeah. Let, let's go through a couple classic running sessions that you might have and what type of shoe might be best for that. So maybe we can start with like the slowest run that you're going to go on all week, your post workout or post long run recovery run, you know, the slowest run that you're going to do all week. What's a good shoe for this? Is this like your classic cushioned trainer? That's going to depend on whether that's something you like. So I would say that your goal with the recovery run is a shoe that is incredibly comfortable. It is not something that needs to be fast because if you start picking the pace up, you're totally going against what the purpose of this session was. The goal is something that maybe if you like this helps you move a little bit more. If you like more cushioning, great. A more cushioned shoe might be better. If you like a little rocker shoe that's going to roll you along, great. Something that helps facilitate you having a comfortable run and staying at the pace you're supposed to be doing, right? So this is why I like using a super shoe that feels really bouncy. If you start going, oh, this feels good, and you pick up the pace, these shoes don't prevent tissue stress, right? You're going to start compensating and doing things that are maybe not appropriate. So your classic shoes... I'm going to just throw out a couple ones. It doesn't mean that those are necessarily appropriate for each person, right? That, but a classic, you know, Sockety Triumph. Um, why am I blanking? I should know these things by uh, an A6 Cumulus. Those kind of things might be a shoe to use for daily training. We also have other options. If you like a lighter shoe, right? Maybe you're someone that does super well in something like the Canvara. The goal is to have a shoe that's not meant to like run as fast as possible. It's supposed to to protect you and facilitate you moving without you have without you wanting to go super duper fast, right? Would the long run be a similar workout for, you know, this type of yeah. shoe as well, you know, a very comfortable shoe. Uh and then my follow-up question to that yeah. is what happens for the more advanced runners who who do workouts within their long runs? Right. So, you know, they might be out there for 2 hours, 2 and right. a half hours. They're you know, they're running 20 miles, but maybe 10 of that is, is at marathon pace. So they're doing a segment at half marathon pace, you know, like where, where's the hybrid shoe, which we yeah. be looking for there. That's a great question. So this can go one of either way. So what a great example of these quote unquote hybrid shoes would be something like we just got called the Boston 12. So this is a shoe from Adidas that has both your typical EVA foams in it, but also some of these newer foams and it's got rods it's still got some flexibility but there's it's got components that some people could race in the thing with long runs is it depends on what you're doing if you're using that long run to prepare for a race be it a half marathon marathon and that's getting closer you actually need to use whatever shoe you plan to use for the marathon because the long run is your practice for that right if you're running easy or if you're doing workouts in it you need to start thinking about what am i going to be using on that because you also have to get used to whatever shoe that is you have to get used to utilizing that for that distance of time just because you've got some special shoe that's supposed to be fast doesn't mean your body's going to be able to tolerate it for 26 miles, 13 miles. You actually have to prep yourself to handle that, right? It's your, how your body reacts to the shoe, not the other way around. So if you're doing a workout, yeah, you got a racing shoe. I would encourage you that, that you probably need to start thinking about practicing with that shoe during those workouts because how else are you going to get used to it and handle it in a race? So it, again, it just depends. If you can't handle that shoe for that long, you're like, oh, I want to save this. There are some really cool shoes out there that are starting to blend some of the components of these quote unquote racing shoes and daily training shoes that you can totally find, right? So the, the Speed 3 from Saucony is another great one. They have the Boston 12. There's lots of ones out there. You just have to kind of find that and go, hey, if I want something for a long run that's still cushioned, but I can still pick up the pace or as a lot of people are doing, going, hey, I don't want to be as beat up after this long run. Let me use a shoe that has some of these foams in it. Go for it. Just make sure that you're feeling comfortable the whole time and know that this is part, part of the training of getting your body used to these things. So, yeah, just depends on what you want to do. Do you think runners should do all of their workouts in, in the shoe that they're going to be running the race in? You know, let's say, let's say you're a half marathoner and yeah. you're going to be doing 
you know, a lot of workouts that are around half marathon pace, maybe tempo pace, a little bit faster, your lactate threshold. Uh, but then you're going to be doing some workouts that are much faster. You know, you might be touching 5K pace, you know, some, pay, you know, more classic VO2 max oriented right. paces. For those kinds of workouts, are we still doing race prep and practicing in the shoe that we're going to wear on race day? Or are there opportunities to wear a different type of shoe? Yeah, it's honestly just going to depend on what you want to do. If you're like, hey, if you want to go, I want to be as comfortable with my, my shoe as possible on race day, go for it. You can do all your runs in that shoe. But if you're like, you know what? I like having a few more tools in my quiver and maybe doing some 5K pace work. I actually want something a little lighter, right? I want something a little close to the ground, a little snappier. Or even you on the track and you want to put on track spikes, great. You know, if that's something you want to do and you can handle that, awesome. So it's it's a personal decision whether you how you want to do that. And that comes from trying things and going, how much time do I need to get used to this shoe? Am I already used to it and I can experiment with stuff? Or, hey, I really need to practice with this thing. That's part of figuring out what works for you. And, and that process too, like I'd be yeah. remiss not to mention this as a coach, but if you are wearing an aggressive shoe, and that can mean a couple different things, but Very different like things, you, yeah. you mentioned track spikes. You know, I grew up running track and cross country, and for eight years I wore track spikes once or twice a week, you know? But I will fully admit that they are absolutely brutal on your feet and legs. So if you're going to experiment with shoes like that, you have to like have the amount of harder running that you think you can handle in these shoes and just give yourself a tiny little bit, you know, a little dose of hard running in these shoes or else your soleus and calves are going to be completely ripped up at the end of that workout. We, uh, not too long ago, I was really curious and we did, it wasn't sent to us, but I bought a track spike that was some of the new super spikes that I was really curious in. And I remember taking the track and I was legitimately scared because like I haven't run in a track spike in over a decade. What is going to happen? So I just I just took it out and just jogged a couple laps Didn't even try anything fast initially. I was like, OK, I can do this. Tried a couple strides and I was like and then I started feeling my calves. I'm like, all right, that's it. <laughs> that, that was the session. And I was sore the next day running 80 yeah. plus miles a week and doing workouts like three to four times a week. And I was like. Whoa. Okay. So yeah, it just depends. And I, I would encourage people, especially with some of the new super foams that it feels really soft. And oftentimes there are certain areas that you will feel less sore in, but there is no, there's, you can't get rid of energy and stress. It will stress other things. We've seen, I clinically, we don't have a ton of evidence on this yet, but tons of hip flexor strains, tons of hamstring stuff for instability. You can still get some Achilles issues. So I'm not trying to scare people with saying that, but just going, if something is crazy aggressive and it's very different from the mechanics of our foot and ankle, you need to take time to get used to it because your body has to adapt to it. If you don't, that's where you're going to start getting problems. Yeah, I think a lot of people think that the only aggressive things in running are like very long runs or very hard workouts. But there's other things that that pose a potential injury risk as well, like very aggressive shoes. Right. And, and I think that's uh, just something important to keep in mind. Matt, when it comes to aggressive shoes, are there any types of shoes that you are just either skeptical about or critical of that runners should just sort of treat, you know, almost like, you know, keep it, keep it at arm's distance. You know, I'm thinking something like, you know, maybe, maybe a pair of Vibram five fingers, you know, where, where you are either the far end of the minimalist maximalist spectrum that you're just like, mm, this may work for some people, but let's really, you know, uh, give this some thought before we jump into it. So for the people viewing, uh, on with video, I'm going to hold up two drastically different shoes, right? So zero shoes versus the Adidas prime X. So one of these has your foot is sitting right against the ground as a minimalist shoe. And the other one, it has, 50 millimeters of stack height in the heel and is incredibly narrow. And the first time I, I ran in them, I thought I was going to break my ankle. And there's actually some sad stories of people actually rolling their ankles in the Prime X and fracturing bones. A buddy of mine over at Kaiser Sunset, where I used to work before I was a professor, um, sent me a message going, hey, we just had this guy come in. And I thought of you because he rolled his ankle in the Prime X that you were talking about. And he has a full-blown fibular fracture. And I was like, oh, gosh. So I'm not trying to scare people, but... When things get that intense, you got to go, is this appropriate? 
on the other side with minimalism stuff, right? It's not that there's anything bad inherently with a super maximal or super minimal shoe. You just have to realize that when you get to extremes, there's going to be very different stresses on your body. A minimal shoe, there's no cushioning. It's all on you. You got to make sure you've got enough ankle motion, strong enough calves to absorb this, and good enough bone density. If you don't have good bone density, you're running a super minimalist shoe, and you're not get, letting your body adapt, you're going to risk stress fractures. You're going to risk Achilles problems. You're going to risk all, you know, foot and ankle things, which is exactly what we saw when the whole minimalist era came about, right? And that doesn't mean that I want to scare people away from this. If you find that this is the shoe that you can run in, or these are the kinds you can, great. Just make sure it's going to take you a long time. There's some evidence suggest if you want to transition to minimal shoes, it can take you anywhere from six to nine months if you want to do this well. On the flip side with max, like these super crazy maximalist shoes, you, it's not free energy, right? As you take work away from the foot and ankle, which these super crazy cushion rockered shoes do, it really increases the amount of motion and stress that happen at the knee and hip. So if you don't have enough hip motion, if you don't have strong enough hip muscles, if you don't have strong enough quad hamstring muscles, you, you're, they're going to have to work really hard to, first of all, stabilize you when you land. Because your foot and ankle is not going to be able to do a lot just because it's so high up. There's, it's such a rigid platform. Your foot's like, I don't know. All your like body awareness, your proprioception, gone. You're like, I, your foot's like, you're on your own. I, uh, I don't know what's going on. Like there's 50 millimeters of stuff between me and the crowd. Good luck. Um, but you've got to be, you have to realize that there's no such thing as free, like injury prevention. A minimalist shoe isn't going to do that for you. A super maximalist shoe is going to not going to do that for you. There are individual things that will put you at risk if you are not adequately prepared for them. Does it mean it's bad if you run a minimalist shoe or if it's bad if you run on a Primex? No, I know people who the Primex is the only shoe they can run in. That is that is the, the one shoe that doesn't give them symptoms. It makes them feel bouncy like when they were younger. Awesome, great. If you can run with it, great. But you also have to go, based on my body, based on my mechanics, is this appropriate? And that's a very personal thing. Are they extremes? Yes. Can certain people handle those extremes? Yes. Is it appropriate for everybody? No, right? We're It's like the bell curve, right? Most people are going to find somewhere in the middle. If you can handle some of those extremes, great, but there's not going to be a ton of people that can do that. How would you advise a runner to think about, you know, the, like the zero shoes, yeah. um, a very minimalist zero drop, very thin sole on the bottom. And, and there's no foam either. My, right. my, I used to have a pair. My understanding is that it's, it's simply a thin strip of rubber only almost like the old Nike waffle cross yeah. country spikes. Right. Yeah. When is it appropriate to use a shoe like this? Um, if, if you're not the type of person who is saying to themselves, I want to be the kind of runner that runs in zero drop minimalist shoes, or, you know, you're not the type of runner who has found that this is the only shoe that works for you. Is there an opportunity to use this shoe for say the average person? There, there definitely is. And I would really encourage anyone who's interested in that kind of shoe, just put it on and walk in it first. We actually have very, cause one of the, one of the, um, arguments for minimalist shoes is that it engages more of your foot musculature, you get better muscle activation, proprioceptive input, your body kind of has a better relationship with the ground, which is great. But you need to get used to that first. And walking, there's great evidence of the fact that walking is as walking in this type of shoe or you know, if, if you need some protection near barefoot is as effective as actually doing foot strengthening exercises for building up the musculature in your foot and ankle. So just starting to go, hey, can I walk around the block in these? If I, It's like a casual weekend and I can go out and walk for a little bit in this shoe and just get my body used to that. That is the best way to start out with that. And that's going to take some time because you're probably going to be sore the first time. And then as you get a little bit more tolerant to that stuff, you can go, hey, you know what? I'm going to try a run walk. We're going to do you know, a casual thing. I'm just going to try running for a couple minutes in these, walking for a little bit. And it's not that your aerobic fitness isn't following up. It's making sure your musculoskeletal system can keep up and then start small, right? Slowly build that up. It's going to, for a lot of people, it feels like starting over, but if you really, really, really want to let your body adapt, which it adapts slowly, you got to take time with that. So walking in them is probably one of the best methods for people that like that feeling. Like I don't really want to run in these, but I kind of like having a pair walking is a, in these is a great tool for foot strengthening. You don't necessarily have to run in them to get some of those benefits. I'm glad you mentioned that because that's actually my approach. You know, I, I 
cannot run in zero drop shoes. I actually just got a pair of Ultra Escalantes and they're great. They're zero yep. drop. They have a, a fair amount of cushioning at the bottom. So they're not as close to the ground as the zero shoes. But I did some walking in them yesterday and my lower legs are a little bit sore, even though I use, you know, only like a four to six millimeter drop shoe for running. And even just walking in a zero drop shoe has made me sore. So when I had zero shoes, when I do have these zero drop shoes, I, I wear them a lot casually going for a walk, hanging out with my kids, going to the playground, you know, doing that kind of thing. And I save the, you know, a little bit more structured, a little bit more supportive shoes for my actual running because I've just found that I need it. So for me personally, like that's how I, you know, use some of these training tools. You know, it's almost like a tool for, for not when I'm running, you know, it's almost like cross training. Right. And, um, you know, the thing that I do like to do is I like to do some barefoot strides for building some foot and, and lower leg strength, uh, and just getting that feeling of running with, you know, either nothing on your foot or something like, uh, the zero shoes or five fingers where there's so little there that you're pretty much running like you would barefoot. Um, those, those, uh, I have found are really great ways to get the benefits of minimalism without having to go run all your miles in minimalist shoes. Right. And there's nothing wrong with going and running all your miles in minimalist shoes. People just have to realize there's a lot of work involved for most of us to get to that point, right? We didn't grow, most of us did not grow up running barefoot all across the streets and what have you. If you're lucky enough to be in a place where you've got dirt and, dirt and it's safe enough to walk and run on, great. But most of us don't have that. So to get your body used to that takes time. It's not an overnight process. Your muscles, your muscles take a minimum of four to six weeks, if not longer to adapt. Bone takes way longer. It can take months plus to adapt to a stimulus. So do people have to just ease into that stuff if it's that, that different for them? Doesn't mean they can't do it. Doesn't mean it's bad. It just means just figure out how extreme it is and how you're going to use it. And then to figure out how much you really need to do in it. So there's one other type of shoe I want to ask you about. They're not as popular today as they were 20, 25 years ago when I first started running. And these are motion control shoes. I don't even know if that term is really used very much anymore. It's, it's a term that gives a lot of, you know, PTs right. and coaches, you know, like shivers up their spine. Yeah. Like, oh, I don't like this. Yeah. But uh, there was an interesting study that uh, I reviewed years and years ago that showed between neutral stability and motion control shoes, the runners in the motion control shoes were the only group of runners where every single one of them got injured during the study. I know the so study. I'm curious yeah. what your thoughts are on motion control shoes and, and how you would even maybe define this today since they're not as popular. Yeah. Cause in, this is actually a really interesting point. Uh, I don't even know where to start with this. So I'm going to just jump in. That study did a very interesting thing where the subjects they included actually didn't have any foot and confirmed stability issues, which makes sense. If you're trying to put somebody in a stiff, uncomfortable shoe, not saying all motion control shoes are stiff and uncomfortable, but if you put someone in a shoe that's not appropriate for them and it's pushing them in certain ways that they're not used to, that makes total sense, right? It's like we, that, that, the, the categorization of the, the, the past is like, okay, that makes sense, right? Why would I give somebody a stability shoe if they don't need this or if they're even sensitive to it. Now that said, there are plenty, there's this, this group that I don't understand, but I still hear about this where these individuals who have these very stiff, high rigid feet that, that don't move at all. And all they want is the ASIC Keanu. And I remember this from working in running stores. And I'm like, that, what? And they're like, yeah, this is the only shoe that I wear. And I'm like, that goes against everything I've been taught, but okay, great. So. That makes sense because I don't think that's appropriate. Somebody that has normal foot and ankle motion and doesn't have any issues or even is a little stiff and lacks motion, trying to do some, give them a, a tool that theoretically does that is uh, going to probably cause issues. That's not surprising at all. The, the challenge with the term motion control is that it was we, I'm not going to say we, a lot of the industry and the medical industry thought for a long time that motion needed to be controlled. If you saw something somewhere, this is the whole thing of, oh, pronation is the cause of all injuries, which we have learned is not true at all. But that was the paradigm we, they were working with. And that we need to stop pronation. We need to control it. The problem is, is you can use these things like a heel counter, a post, all these different mechanisms that supposedly stopped it. And what we found is that influence is probably the better word. 
because yes, it might influence, it might change some of the velocities of motion, but a lot of people would still roll just as far. They would still move just as much. The term motion control doesn't actually work. The only way you're going to motion control someone is if you like, like wrap their ankle up in one of those like fracture boots. And then that maybe that's motion control, right? I'm just kidding. But we just found it wasn't doing what we thought. And so that's where as a geek and someone interested as somebody who typically needed a little bit of stability, not a ton, I was like, there's got to be a better way to do this. And so that's where I started talking about the term st this that I just made up and seems to have taken off called stable neutral, meaning there's other ways to influence foot motion because you want you just want things to go forward, right? You don't necessarily need to force it to go forward because we know that each person moves in a very unique way. Why? We don't always know. There's very individual components to how their limbs are lined up, different joint angles. It's impossible. Unless you do like a 10-year study on a single person, you're not going to fully know that. But trying to control motion isn't the best term. So now we've had a shift, and I, I think Ben O'Neill can be kind of the, the – uh, gets a, a lot of credit for this because he came up with this concept called the, the uh, preferred motion pathway. We all move a little bit different. The goal of a shoe isn't to force you in a certain way, but to help facilitate however you move to try to just get you forward, right? That might mean you kind of prony in one way and then you come off it. As long as you the shoe helps facilitate the person forward, that's the key. So you're – so – Motion control shoes still exist. There are still shoes like the Brooks Beast or things like that that still – people still like them, right? Certain people may do really, really well in that shoe. But the global market, the general consumer, we kind of realized not everybody needs this crazy motion control shoe because it's not doing what we thought. And it's certainly not preventing all these injuries we thought it was going to. And so now there's been a shift in going, how do we make the shoes – work better for the individual? How do we get them to adapt, right? The concept of stable neutral, meaning can we put components in there that will that will facilitate your motion forward if you need them and get out of your way if you don't, right? Trying to get that more individualized approach. So that's why motion control shoes have just dropped in, uh, in availability so much is because we kind of realized that paradigm wasn't working for the greater population. It can be frustrating for people that those shoes work really well because now they have limited options, but that's just kind of go how it goes, right? They're they're you're kind of now in some, in that smaller, unique group, whereas the overall population probably needs something that's stable, neutral, or just not something that even gets in the way of them, and they need to work on strength or other components. So, it was more complicated than just controlling motion. Yeah, it's also just something that I think we've since learned was was maybe in an overly specific response to thinking that that movement of pronation was something that we had to control anyway, you know, right. and, and I don't think it really was. We've now learned that, you know, I don't even like the term over pronation. I try not to use that at all. Right. Some level of pronation is entirely normal. Yeah. Um, and, and it's a good thing. It's not that it's just normal, but it's not really helping you. Like, no, right. it's a way that you are absorbing force and yes. uh, holding on to it and, and getting a little bit of that free energy return through the, the ankle there. Right. So, yeah, it's more, it, can it, you control that motion, right? Because if exactly. you can control it and use it elastically, that you're going to get some great bounce. You're going to shock absorb really well. We know that people that do not pronate actually tend to be at higher risk for things like bone stress injuries, like stress fractures and stuff like that, versus people that don't, that have the supposed flat feet, actually tend to have lower risks of those types of injuries, right? So it's just biomechanics, right? It's not like, you know, you don't, you can't be like, this is bad biomechanics human very humans vary so much like we're still learning what good and bad really means and there may that may turn those terms don't even really shouldn't even exist for this you know i'll never forget this <clears throat> excuse me i'll never forget this picture of you know world-class east african runner on the track he's he's turning on yep. the track and you know he's winning the race and he's pronating so much you know his his foot is almost like kind of sideways yep. i forget exactly who it was it was years ago but there was like this uproar on the internet about how his leg was going to fall off and, oh my goodness, this guy's going to snap his Achilles or something. And, you know, I was reminded of this by you saying you have to be able to control the movement, not necessarily have the movement be controlled by the shoe. And obviously this runner was on the track, uh, so he was wearing track spikes, very little stability, if, if anything at all. Uh, so he's essentially running the same way that he would barefoot. And I guess you can't really criticize success too much, right? I mean, here he is winning the race. He's healthy, uh, fast, and he, he, he succeeded in the endeavor that he was attempting at that moment. So 
Um, it just, just to say pronation is normal, and even at the highest levels of sport, you are going to see some dramatic pronation, and, and that movement is not necessarily something that we should demonize. Right. I think one of the, the bigger cons, it's very easy to try to simplify things right away. Right. It's like, oh, I see this. That, that's, that was a photo. I remember that. It's, it's a static photo, though. And we know that static pictures and assessments are not accurate for determining what motion's happening and what, how, what the injury risk of another human being is. I, my exact example of that, and this is kind of awkward now because this person was caught, caught for doping. I used to reference Preska Jeptu all the time, which she, when she ran, just had this insane internal rotation of her femurs, and it looked like she was like cross-legged the entire run. I was like, she's still running like a 218, 217 marathon with these mechanics that we've been demonizing for so long. But somehow that's working for it might, might, might have been the drugs, I guess. But, you know, she got dope busted for that. So, yeah, kind of some other variables there. But you have to be careful when you see something in, like, isolation or a single photo. You need to start asking better questions about going, huh, is this actually an issue or is this just their normal and it seems to be working for them? You can only make those kind of sim – the, the process to get to those simplistic comments like, hey, running shoes, right, going back to the beginning – you really need to learn what works for you. The process to get there has taken 50, 60 plus years of people trying things, getting it wrong, getting published, having things revoked because it did turn out it wasn't true at all. Like there's so much work that goes into those simple concepts. So I think that's what people have to respect is things are a lot more complicated than we give it credit for. But that doesn't mean that you can't, there's, there's not some simple components there. Just you got to respect that and not try to jump to conclusions so quick which is really hard when you want the answers right away. I say that as a PhD candidate right now with students going like, hold on, you need to wait. Not that I'm judging because I'm impatient too, but. It's like, you know, every, every answer the coach gives is always, right. it depends. Right, it's exactly. Never satisfying. Never satisfying. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to get better at that because my students like actually like, like almost yelled at me the other day because like, you say this all the time. And I was like, all right, is there a better way I can phrase this? Like, it it's like finish the sentence, right? It depends on the runner. It depends on the patient profile. It depends on what you're looking for. So I think maybe we just have to finish the sentence so people aren't as mad. Well, let's talk a little bit about those other components that you were talking about of training that will help you with movement, whether, right. whether you're, you know, you have a lot of pronation or you have a lot of internal rotation of the femur, whatever it might be. Uh, you know, and I ask this because I have often fielded questions from runners and, and there's some somewhere along the lines of I've never gotten hurt in my life. And then I tried X, Y, Z shoe. And after one run, I was injured. And, you know, I, I'm always like a little skeptical of, of this idea. And, and typically I'll ask a few more questions and we'll get to the fact that, oh, you actually ran six miles longer than you've ever run before on right. that day. Right. So. What are some things that we can do in training to make us a little bit more resilient to whatever we're going to put on our feet, whether it's track spikes for a hard workout, whether it's a pair of super shoes for, you know, a rock and long run as we're getting ready for a marathon, you know, what, what are, you know, your, your physical therapy, uh, ideas for becoming more resilient for any shoe that we want to wear? You know, it's funny you bring this up because I've been thinking about this every day and this, I promise is on topic. Earlier this year, actually around January, not running related, by the way, I broke my toe carrying our cat and I stubbed it on, a, on our barbell that was just laying in the wrong place. And for the first time in years, I couldn't run. So I actually had to kind of start over and I probably progressed quicker than I should have based on bone tissue healing timelines, but we won't talk about that. Um, it was the first time I had to go, wow, you know what? I actually have this weird opportunity to start over. And I had kind of been plateauing for a while. Like I, I do too many things between doctors running, PhD, teaching, all this other stuff. But it finally gave me a chance to kind of go, you know, here's where I want to get, but I also have to actually, find, and maybe this is just getting a little bit older, is that I was, it just takes, you have to respect time. Your body takes time to adapt to something. If you want to try something, you go, I have this goal. Ask yourself, all right, how am I going to get there? And how do I get there in a way that gives my body time to adapt to what I'm asking it to? So my my example is, you know, I used to be able to run a 1445 5K. I can't do that anymore. I clicked off a 1730 not too long ago. And now I'm going, to, hey, I'm going to make short-term goal. Like I want to try to get under 17 
minutes again. And it's not like, oh, you know, I used to run this fast. It's like, yeah, we changed, right? I should mention my PhD is on Achilles and uh, the in aging in uh, runners. So it's given me some more humility and maturity on this. But give your body time to adapt to things. You do not get stronger from the workouts you do. You do not get, like, if you, like, let me rephrase that. You don't get stronger when you finish the workout. If you just did some 400, you just did a tempo run, you did a long run, you are actually not stronger. You are now weaker because you just broke yourself down. You won't get better unless you give your body time to recover and adapt to what you just did, right? So if you do too much, that fitness, you're gonna, it's going to drop you really far. So the balance of this is going, giving yourself enough of a stimulus that you drop and you can recover from. And not that so much that starts to injure you, right? So you don't want to do things that are too intense that your body's not ready for. You can do little things like that. You just have to ease your body into it. So giving your understanding how your body actually adapts to training is probably the best thing you can learn to try to like stay healthy. And you're going to have little things that pop up here and there. I don't want to tell people, yeah, you're going to do this perfectly and you're never going to get injured again. You're participating in one of the, the sports that has the highest injury rate. Not the highest, but it's fairly high, right? Like 60, 70% of runners get injured every year, and nothing that we've done has changed that. It happens. It's a high-stress activity. You're going to learn something from it. It might be a day. It might be a couple weeks. It's just going, what are you going to learn from this, and how are you going to adapt to this? And that's probably the best thing is learning and learning how your body actually responds to training. If you, a lot of people go, oh, you know what? For this workout, I'm gonna, you know, even though my coach said this pace, I'm gonna throw on the super shoes. And I'm gonna hit like a, like 30 seconds faster than that. Why? Why? Why would you do that? Right? This is the thing that you need to get the stimulus you want. Why would you do more? Because that's only gonna break you down more. Like Jack Daniels, the coach, at, the one of the, like fairly famous coach who wrote. Um, uh, Laura, not Laura running. Oh my God. The Jack Daniels yeah, formula. Duh. Oh my gosh. That was embarrassing. <laughs> uh, wrote We're the book that he has his out, name man. on. Um, this in. <laughs> <laughs> the book that he has his name on used to make a comment that you should not do any more than you need to do to get what you get the stimulus you want. You don't get extra credit for doing a ton of extra stuff. If your body can adapt to it. Yeah. If you maybe balance it out going, you know, maybe I need to do a little bit more mobility work today. Maybe I need to think ahead about I need to work on a little bit of strength here. But you need to put that all together. Like you experienced with the ultra shoe, right? You were just walking in it and you were sore from it. You also think about cumulative tr stuff throughout the day, right? If, if you're going, oh, I only ran four miles, but then I went and did Orange Theory for an hour, and then I weightlifted for an hour, and then I went for a two-hour hike on the same day. It's like that's – yeah, and you're wondering why your, your, your knee or your ankle hurts like – just think about how your body adapts and be patient because it has its own schedule for how it adapts to it, I think would be the shorter version of the long thing that I just – the tangent I went on. Well, I, I'm interested in your PhD being yeah. on the Achilles and, and on aging folks because that's actually like – one of the areas in your body that is most susceptible to injury as you get older. Uh, it is. And correct me if I'm wrong, a little bit more likely among men too. Yes. Um, at least that's what we thought. Some of the systematic reviews have questioned that a little bit, but that is okay. some of the, the majority of literature right now would tend to suggest that. But even across all genders, um, as you get older, as you become a master's runner, Achilles tendinopathy tends to be the number one injury that people deal with. So it goes, it's Achilles, calf, and hamstring are the top three, which is drastically different from younger athletes, which the top one, not saying people never get this, is knee, like patellofemoral, anterior knee pain, IT bands, IT band stuff, and then Achilles is fairly close, and I think shin, or, uh, and I don't want to say shin splints because that is not the right term. Um, like uh, medial tibial stress syndrome, which is the fancier way of saying that, are kind of the more common things. But there's a drastic shift. My dissertation is trying to figure out why does that happen because we don't we have no idea why it's happening. So I don't think you can really treat it if you don't know what what's driving that. Do you have any hunches as you're working through this gnarly problem of of why this injury is so common among older folks? Yeah. So I don't want people to think this is a conclusion because I just finished my methods section. So I've got my third chapter done and we, I've gotten some subjects testing. And even though I'm just looking at, hey, is it even reliable to test this amazing group of people? 
it was very interesting to watch how they responded. So we do know, regardless if you're a runner or not, as we get older, we tend to lose strength in our, our distal or far extremities quick, quickest. And we lose calf strength more than just about anything else in the body. So we, we lose calf muscle mass for sure. We lose a disproportionate amount of muscle strength compared to that loss of muscle mass. And we lose a disproportionate amount of power compared to the muscle, the, the strength amount. So what I suspect is that we are losing quite a bit of calf power because as we get older, right? People, when's the last time you, I mean, a lot of people, when's the last time you jumped or you try to like, like hop up on a step or do something like that. Most people don't do it. So I had these very well accomplished masters runners come in and part of the testing was having them do a single leg hop. And I don't think I've seen anybody get as frustrated as these individuals to realize they almost couldn't do it. And I'm sitting there going, Oh no, like they can't do a single leg hop. How am I going to test this? Cause I'm looking at their running. We've got a 3d motion capture system. So I'm looking at the running mechanics, they're hopping on force plates and then going over to a strength, an isokinetic dynamometer and testing their strength. And it was very interesting to watch them struggle with doing a single leg hop. So a horizontal single leg hop, very much I, the propulsion phase very much isolates your cap and your hip extensors. So people can hop in place usually because that's much more of your knee that you're using. But to propel yourself forward with the single leg hop, that is primarily calf and hip. And to watch how much they struggle with this was like, oh, that's very – like this person just ran like a 1635K as a plus 50-year-old, and they're struggling with the single leg hop. Like that doesn't make sense. That's a, and then testing them on the, uh, the dynamometer, I'm testing hip strength and calf strength. The how quickly they generated force at their calf was not normal compared to younger individuals from what I know from the literature. It took a while to get up to the max, and it took them a while almost to warm up. So I had to actually add additional warm-up trials for strength testing because some people took them a while to go, how do I produce this much force? So I think it has to do with a lot of – and this is something runners don't want to hear – is I really think that people need to be working on strength and power. You know, you can do this with like hill repeats and sprints and stuff like that, but I think people need to be lifting heavy. I think they need to be going, can I work on just two to three times a week of some power and strength exercises and not even at a gym, just going, hey, can I get a couple heavy weights and just work on this? Because we're clearly losing it. And we know that from the literature. We just didn't necessarily know that was happening as extensively in Masters Runners. Now, granted, I've only got 10 of them, actually 14, 10 were actually like the data was good enough for me to actually analyze, but... I think it's needing to continue to work on strength and power because those are things that we tend to lose as we get older. Doesn't mean you can't get it back because there's no age where you can actually start working on that. There, no age that you won't get benefit from working on it. There's literature that suggests even people in, that are 95 to 100 years old, they will adapt to strength training. They will adapt to power training. I just think that people need to go, there's a couple extra things you might need to do that is just important for maintaining your system if you want to keep doing this. I love that. Yeah. And you're, you're talking about so many other things that I think are beneficial for every runner, not right. just runners who want to reduce their injury risk or older runners. You know, we're talking about things like drills, plyometrics, right? We're talking about heavy weightlifting. You know, these are the components of a training program that I think are perhaps fundamental, um, you know, in the right dose at the right time, of course, but you know, for, for any runner who might have these kinds of injuries, you know, we're talking about shoes, so lower leg or foot injuries, you know, I, I think exposure to similar forces is really important. So that's where some of the hopping plyometrics can come in. Uh, it was funny. I was actually just at the playground with my kids yesterday doing some, doing some jumping drills. Right. And I was like, you know, I always jump with my left leg. So I'm going to do some jumps with my right leg and, you know, just trying to like feel how my body is moving because I certainly have a preferred jumping leg. Um, and, and just getting that exposure, working on strength training regularly, uh, and, and perhaps with a bit more focus on the calves, if you're an older runner, sounds like a, a really good preventative approach for a lot of these common injuries. Yeah, I would definitely agree on that. And that actually goes back to your other question going, Hey, you know, and this is what the evidence is showing, like, yes, smart training, not overstretching the tissue more than it can adapt. But going back to what you asked, like, hey, if somebody kind of moves in a way that they feel like they don't have control over, practicing that movement and starting to load it with weight is probably one of the best ways to get that control going. Let's just expose our body to this. Let it adapt to it. 
and then slowly easing in train smart but you know that teaching your body to handle higher loads weight training hopping jumping those like fast high load things is really important it's probably one of the few things we know that actually not only reduces your injury risk but actually can improve your performance as well so it's kind of a nice especially because the calf is your was one of the primary propulsive muscles for running so you know if you still want to run faster right it's not just a like hey i just don't want to get hurt it's it might be a good you know i still want to run fast and kick younger people's butts yeah no I, I love those things that will not only help you stay healthy not only sort of just develop you as an athlete get stronger but also actually give you results where you want it which is right. on the race course so obviously a no-brainer from my perspective to do some strength training and and really think of yourself as an athlete who's going to be doing jumps and plyos right. and drills and all those other things that are really important for right. your general athleticism um Matt, is, is there anything I might have missed about how to choose running shoes and, and all the different considerations that there are? I mean, this is like, you know, this is like a 70 year project in the United States here yeah. of perfecting the running shoes. Right. So obviously, we didn't like solve this problem today right. in the last 55 minutes, but uh, I feel like we gave runners a very good framework for understanding the options out there, when to use them, how to adapt to different shoes. And also just sort of like the long-term patient outlook of if you are going to use a more aggressive shoe, whether that's maximalist or minimalist, let's do it very gradually. Maybe let's do the, the strength, the plyos, the hops, all that other work so that you're becoming more resilient and can handle those shoes. But is there any other aspect of choosing shoes or using shoes as tools that you'd like to add before we wrap for today? I, my last comment, which sounds very, I hope this doesn't come out the wrong way. Um, there is no such thing as a perfect shoe. And that I know a lot of people get very overwhelmed looking at how many shoes are available. At this point, you got to just try a couple things on. There's a lot of very cool variability. And shoes today are so much better fit-wise, comfort-wise than they were even like five, ten years ago. Like I, I – found a, a pair of New Balance 905s, which was my favorite shoe in high school. Um, I'll be very impressed if anybody knows what that shoe is. It was a lightweight trainer with just a mild little bit of stability. And I found a pair recently on eBay. It was brand new. Now, part of this is also the foams breakdown. But I put it on, and the upper and the fit of the shoe was one of the most uncomfortable things I have tried in recent times. And I was like, oh, we have gone, there's nothing wrong with the shoe. That was great at that time, but we have so many good options. And so people, I would say, don't worry so much. Just get a couple things, try some stuff on, realize that you can't chase perfection here. There's, it's always going to change, right? Companies are constantly changing stuff. So what you can do is go pick something, see how it goes, learn from it, and just enjoy running. Because at the end of the day, if you over, if you over obsess over exactly what running shoe you're going to try to wear, then you're going to create a whole website and an Instagram and a YouTube like me. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, at <laughs> some point forbid. you just, yeah, heaven forbid. At some point you just got to get out the door. So put it on, learn from it, right? It's just like training. Sometimes you'll learn that certain training things work really well and others don't. Just put it on and go for it. If it doesn't fit really well, if it's really bothering you, go exchange it. But if it's working well for you, focus on the run. I love that. This, this, this really speaks to the idea that this is all a giant act of experimentation. You've got to find what works for you. You need to wear a lot of different shoes to see how they impact you, how they feel on your body, um, especially how they feel when you're out running. So right. if, you're gonna, if you're trying them on at a shoe store, go for a little jog somewhere. You know, find, find, a, find an area where you can actually run so that you can see how those shoes respond to you. But there's no one right answer and uh, certainly no one right pair of shoes. Right. Um, Matt, the Doctors of Running Instagram account is, is pretty amazing. I suggest everyone go and check it out. Uh, is there anywhere else that you want to point folks to to continue learning from you? Yeah, probably the best place So the Instagram is how we – kind of to give people a small piece of what we're doing. So the original website, www.doctorsrunning.com is where you will find all the content in terms of our shoe reviews, in terms of all the written stuff that we do and links to everywhere else. We've also got a podcast, Doctors Running, where we review, we 
do the same thing, talk about shoes. We review a lot of people from the industry, and I've got, we've got some really cool stuff coming out. Some people were just very cool people we guys talked about. We've got all the other things. I think the thing that actually has blown up the most is our LinkedIn account. Um, if for those of you that don't know the, if you really want to interact with people in the running shoe industry, they're all on LinkedIn. If they don't have an Instagram or Facebook, they have it there. So that's another great place. We still post contact and content, pretty, YouTube, pretty much anywhere else you can find us. But the website is probably the best place to start because that has the connections to everything else. Great links to all of that will be on the strength running site in the show notes. So folks can check it out there if they don't want to use their memory, but Matt, thank you so much for, for being here, for your expertise, and for all the work that you're doing to help runners. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me.